He was a fugitive wanted for the murder of six children, and just because someone bore a slight resemblance to him, Teabag ruthlessly picked up a metal object from the table and struck the other's head. Yet, even such an utterly wicked person deeply yearned to be an ordinary good person, not long ago, Teabag assumed someone else's identity and became the sales director of a company. The boss's commendation allowed him to experience the joy of being an ordinary person for the first time. It was from this moment that Teabag truly wanted to tear off the murderer's label and live an ordinary, mundane, and free life. However, his greed was still lurking within him. For money, Teabag once again became someone else's accomplice. Following Don's orders, he took Gretchen's sister Rita and daughter Emily hostage. Just then, a zealous priest suddenly showed up to peddle Bibles. Teabag wanted to drive him away, but the priest kept on talking non-stop about the Bible, showing no intention of leaving. Suddenly, Teabag noticed the military academy ring on the priest's finger, mistaking the priest for an assassin sent by the company. Teabag suddenly threw a heavy punch, knocking him to the ground. After dragging the priest into the room, Teabag asked Don what to do with this guy, and was instructed to do away with the priest. In the past, killing someone was something Teabag could do without even blinking an eye, but now he hesitated, because once he pulled the trigger, the life he longed for would truly disappear forever. Teabag decided to give the priest another chance. He asked the priest to recite a passage from the Bible and state which chapter and verse it was from. Hearing the priest recite it flawlessly, Teabag was incredibly happy. Unexpectedly, the always cruel and brutal man smiled because he didn't have to kill anyone. Teabag, feeling a burden lifted, threw away the handgun. Along with his past dirtiness, he secretly let Rita and Emily go, urging them to escape as far as possible. Then, Teabag also untied the ropes binding the priest's hands and feet. But as soon as the priest stood up, he landed a punch on Teabag's face. Teabag never expected that the other party was indeed an assassin sent by the company. From then on, Teabag fell into the company's hands again. Meanwhile, Don, knowing that Michael had stolen parts of Scylla, immediately stormed the base, furiously deploying tear gas grenades in an attempt to force Michael to surrender. You're surrounded. Come out with your piece of Scylla, Michael. But Lincoln was lurking nearby following the sound of gunfire to the rooftop and easily taking down this deceitful man. However, Gretchen, who was lying in ambush, also rushed in. During the confrontation, Don finally reveals why he stole Scylla. He had been working diligently for the government for the past 17 years, only to end up as a lowly clerk. He figured he might as well sell Scylla and retire early. In the end, Don did not forget to entice Michael. They could find a buyer who could take down the company thus achieving your goal while also getting a big share of the money. Michael pretended to agree, actually buying time. He quietly had Sucre sneak into their car's trunk. Sucre followed them to their hotel, and the group immediately set up defenses there, ready to snatch Scylla once again. But Don was not so naive. Among the tear gas grenades he had launched, one contained an ultrasonic device. He had the warehouse under his complete control. Thus, Don discovered the Scylla part hidden in the restroom. The escape team surrounded the hotel, ready to act, due to tampering with the emergency stairs beforehand. As Don tried to escape and fell to the ground, Michael seized Scylla and hurriedly fled. But Michael hadn't gotten far when a severe headache struck again, and a torrent of blood poured from his nostrils, eventually leaving him powerless and collapsed on the ground. Don seized Scylla once again. Like I said before, this is just business. However, at that moment, the company's assassins suddenly appeared, and Gretchen hurriedly took Don away. Eventually, the unconscious Michael fell into the company's hands, and Lincoln, hiding in a corner, could only watch helplessly as his brother was taken away. On the other hand, the fleeing Don and Gretchen hurried to the base and effortlessly found the missing part of Scylla. When Lincoln and the others arrived back at the base, they realized that they had lost both their lives and their troops. An unprecedented sense of frustration instantly crushed the prison break team. They were utterly lost. With no other options, Lincoln approached the company's Krantz. Krantz directly proposed a deal, if you help me retrieve Scylla, the company can provide Michael with the most advanced treatment. At this point, they had no bargaining chips. To save his brother, Lincoln had to go against his conscience and work for the company they had tried so hard to take down. Added incentive.
The doctor drilled into Michael's skull and inserted two catheters, yet Michael felt no pain and remained fully conscious. Sarah, anxious and uneasy, inquired about the purpose of the catheters. The doctor explained that there was an egg-sized arteriovenous malformation in Michael's brain. The catheters were meant to isolate the tumor, but they would also stimulate the brain. Hearing, smell, and memory would be triggered as well. At that moment, Michael's memories flashed before his eyes like a revolving lantern, and his consciousness seemed to return to Fox River State Penitentiary. He saw the familiar wash basin in front of him and heard a kind voice behind him. It was Charles, who had died. They began a dialogue about the meaning of life. Michael's eyes were filled with guilt. In his quest to save his brother Lincoln, he had deceived too many people. Perhaps if it weren't for his selfishness, many people wouldn't have died. Charles urged him not to blame himself. After all, some things are beyond our control. Michael turned around, and the information hidden in his memories covered the walls. Yet, the current him had not obtained evidence of the company's crimes and had lost the faith to continue fighting. Charles reminded him that things are not always what they seem on the surface. Everything you experience has its own significance. This statement sparked an inspiration in Michael. All along, they had thought Scylla was a hard drive storing the company's illegal operations. But if it were that simple, why would the company protect it with such tight security instead of just destroying it? Michael connected the fragments of his memories about Scylla. It was the residual memory from the last time he hit and eavesdropped on a conversation among the company's six heads, during which a word was repeatedly mentioned. Michael grasped the last few minutes before breaking out of the dream and tried hard to break down this word with a marker pen. It was not until this moment that he truly understood the meaning of Scylla. Meanwhile, in reality, the arteriovenous malformation in Michael's brain was finally removed, but his heartbeat suddenly dropped to zero. The doctors were frantic and at a loss, but Sarah, unwilling to give up and inspired by love, finally brought Michael back to life. He told Sarah the answer. The letters split into four rare elements from the periodic table. Theoretically, if these elements could be integrated into the design of solar cells, it would be possible to use solar energy at 100% efficiency. Whoever mastered this technology could change the global landscape. This is why someone was willing to pay hundreds of millions of dollars for Scylla. Their goal was not to take down the company but to become the company. On the other hand, Lincoln, who had already sided with the company, met Teabag under Krantz's arrangement, who had also been captured, to force out the location of Don and the buyer's transaction. Lincoln brutally pulled out Teabag's tooth. I was just full of God. Tell me! I like the beer! I like, I like the beer! When? What time? Three o'clock. <laughs> At the dock, under Gretchen's arrangement, Don met with Patrick. Patrick begins to inspect the goods, and this time Scylla is really in one piece. Don asked Patrick if the real buyer was on his way, and when he got a positive answer, he shot Patrick dead. It turned out that Don wanted to deal directly with the buyer to save the 30% introduction fee. Gretchen was stunned by the hypocrisy of the man before her. Just then, Gretchen received a call from Rita, saying that she and Emily had safely escaped to a neighbor's house. Only Teabag had been taken away. Gretchen knew well that as long as Teabag was given a taste of sweetness or bitterness, he would surely reveal the time and place of the transaction. So she immediately notified the buyer to change the transaction location. By the time Lincoln arrived, Don and Gretchen had already disappeared without a trace. Soon after, Don and the new buyer came to a warehouse to make the transaction. The buyer accessed Scylla's data, which contained files on nuclear energy, wind energy, and solar energy, clearly not the company's blacklist as previously claimed. This indirectly confirmed Michael's speculation. However, suddenly, Lincoln and Sucre, leveraging the company's powerful tracking capabilities, infiltrated the warehouse and were embroiled in a fierce gunfight with Gretchen. Meanwhile, the buyer had no intention of paying and took advantage of the chaos to flee with Scylla, shooting Don on the way out. Eventually, Gretchen ran out of bullets, and Don, severely injured, was taken back by Lincoln and Sucre. Where is he? I don't know. Where is he? I don't know! Gone! Stolen. By who? By who? If I die, you'll never know. On the way back, Sucre felt exhausted. Pardon was no longer an option, and now that Lincoln was safe and Michael's surgery had gone smoothly, 
He wanted to return to his own life. Lincoln understood his actions, and the two embraced and parted ways. Back at the company, Lincoln reported the situation to Krantz. Now that only Don and Gretchen knew the buyer's identity, Krantz suggested they form a new team to search for Scylla. Lincoln shared the deal he made with Krantz with Michael, who couldn't understand why Lincoln would help the company. Lincoln says, just like you did when you got tattooed and went to jail to save my life. I don't care who gets Scylla, I only care if you live or die. He handed Michael the document Krantz had given him. Lincoln claimed our mother also worked for the company, and I am merely continuing the family business. But Michael clearly would not work for Krantz, insisting that Scylla, as cutting-edge technology, must not fall into the hands of a dangerous company. Eventually, the brothers parted ways on bad terms. Under Krantz's arrangement, Lincoln continued the pursuit of Scylla's whereabouts with this motley crew, each with their own agenda, with three teammates who all have a history of turning against each other. Can this odd combination finally succeed? Freshly recovered from a serious illness, Michael opened his eyes to find himself imprisoned in a villa deep within the jungle. It is situated somewhere near 60 miles away, and is so full of ferocious beasts that unarmed escape is almost impossible. Krantz had even sent one of the world's top psychologists, Roger, in an attempt to brainwash Michael into joining the company using various methods. But Michael, constantly thinking about how to bring down the company, would never become Krantz's lackey, with no other strategies available. Roger revealed a shocking secret. Your mother works for us. Your mother is alive. It turned out that Michael's mother was still alive and an important high-level executive at the company. For years, she had been secretly monitoring her son's movements, hoping that one day Michael would become her right-hand man. Roger tried to break through Michael's psychological defenses using the bond of mother and son but was sharply rebuked by Michael. In Michael's view, if his mother was indeed a high-level executive at the company, why did she choose to stand by as Lincoln faced the electric chair at Fox River State Penitentiary? So you did a little digging, good for you. But everything out of your mouth is a lie, and I don't believe a word of it. Rational thought told Michael he couldn't just sit and wait to die. Michael carefully observed the situation inside the room, planning his escape. On the other hand, Lincoln, under Krantz's arrangement, continues to track down Scylla with this motley crew of men with their own agendas. But after a day's effort, they made no progress. Don thinks Lincoln is incompetent, so he allies with Teabag in an attempt to seize leadership. Gretchen remains neutral, stating she is fine with whoever becomes the leader, just when Lincoln was isolated and without support. Mahone finally returned after dealing with personal matters. No. Perfect. The second you stop doing what I tell you to do, I'm gonna blow your brains out. With Mahone by his side, Lincoln had enough support, and Don dared not oppose any longer. Meanwhile, an anxious Sarah informed Lincoln that Michael was being held captive stating she would go to rescue Michael alone. Unknown to them, their conversation was overheard by Teabag, who, eager to gain some advantage, hurriedly reported to Krantz. Ten credit. Got the location on a shining night. She may be heading there now. Exemplary, Bagwell. Thank you, sir. Upon receiving the news, Krantz urgently called Roger, instructing him to inject Michael with an anesthetic and then transfer him. At that moment, Michael was in the bathroom, planning his escape, intending to use a mix of two chemicals to corrode the water heater's piping. But just as Michael stepped out, two agents held him down and injected him with an anesthetic. However, at that moment, a loud noise came from the bathroom, and one agent rushed in to check. As the agent opened the door, the massive flow of water from the melted pipe knocked him down. Michael took advantage of the chaos to pick up a handgun, threatening the agents to inject Roger with the anesthetic then ordered the bodyguards to handcuff themselves. Michael quickly left the villa. By then, the transfer vehicle arranged by Krantz had arrived. Upon entering the room and finding Michael had escaped, they immediately chased after him on ATVs. Freshly recovered from his illness, Michael couldn't possibly outrun the ATVs and was soon caught up. Turn around. But suddenly, a jeep sped towards them, knocking the agents aside. And the driver was none other than Sarah who had come to rescue, after escaping pursuit. Michael urgently called Lincoln, trying to convince him not to work for Krantz, but Lincoln stated that to save your life, I've already signed a lifetime agreement with Krantz, only by handing over Scylla to Krantz can everyone return to a peaceful life. Michael believed that Scylla, 
As the world's most cutting-edge technology, falling into the hands of a company up to no good would be unimaginable. Standing on their respective grounds, neither brother was willing to compromise. Turning from close comrades into opponents, Michael pays $100 to bribe the driver and hides in the cargo truck's compartment, preparing to head to Miami to compete for Scylla. Meanwhile, Gretchen successfully tracked down the buyer who had stolen Scylla. Scott, turns out, Scott was also an internal agent for the company, but Gretchen didn't share this significant discovery with the team. Instead, she secretly arranged to meet Scott. Gretchen spends a reward of $10 million to help Scott escape the company's pursuit. From their conversation, it was clear Scott was just a worker, and Scylla had already been moved to the real mastermind behind the scenes. After Scott agreed, Gretchen lured the four to a building under the pretense of finding the buyer's address, planning to eliminate Lincoln and his group. Scott's agents surrounded the four, and Gretchen aimed her gun at Don. Upon realizing the betrayal, Don cursed out loud, using foul language. Just as Gretchen was about to pull the trigger, she remembered her daughter, her conscience kicking in. She suddenly turned the gun on Scott, taking down two of his men instantly. Scott attempted to retaliate, but Mahone shot Scott dead, and Gretchen also fell, wounded. Teabag snatched Scott's cell phone from his pocket, and Lincoln angrily aimed his gun at Gretchen. Teabag mentioned Gretchen had an eight-year-old daughter, softening Lincoln's heart, leaving the severely injured Gretchen to fend for herself. Back at the hotel, as they pondered their next move, Scott's phone suddenly rang. Lincoln answered the call. Hello? Your boy's dead. And now I'm coming after you. You hear me? It turns out this person is Christina, the mother of Michael and Lincoln. Scylla has already fallen into her hands. Who was that? It was my son. 